Okay, good morning. good morning. Welcome to the Bond Sunday Morning Services. Thank you so much for being a part of it. I absolutely appreciate it. I am Jesse Lee Peterson. Um, you can get involved with this topic, the subject today, by calling 800-411-2663, 1-800-411-BOND. And you can also email us, church at bondinfo.org, church at bondinfo.org, and put your name in town, name in town on your emails. And I, we can, I can answer your questions today. Whether you agree or disagree, let me hear from you. Good morning, everybody here. Good morning. How are you? Oh, good. Um, I like that topic we were talking about, about respect. Is that food for thought? Yes. Yeah. And really, you got some issues if you need somebody to respect you. We'll talk about that another time. This year, our theme is, uh, <coughs> oh, it's not up there. Is, uh, <laughs> no, no, that was last year. Oh. That was last year, buddy. Uh, trust, truth. truth. Yes. Trust, truth. Have you guys been thinking about that this week? Yes. Yes. Uh, let me just read something for you, and then we'll get into what you got from Trust and Truth. Because this year, I am totally committed to not just coming here preaching at you. I want to see, are you getting and growing from uh, this subject this year? Because it's a waste of time. You know, I think about a lot of preachers. They just go every Sunday, they preach the Bible to you, and they take your money, and they go home day in and day out every Sunday, and nothing is happening. People are still messed up. And I think that there's an issue with that. And my job is to point you to the source that's going to set you free. And then when you're out there in the world, you can be a living example for others. Otherwise, you're a waste of time in life. If you're not a, a good and a, a living example for your family, for the world around you. What's a, I wonder, and it just occurred to me, I wonder what is the purpose of being alive if you ain't no good? <laughs> really, why would anybody want to live and they're just no good? It's like they're in the way. Anybody ever thought about that? <laughs> you're, not, you're not good for nothing. It's like when God made us, he made something that was good and perfect. And, and how come I don't, you know, like, why be alive if you're not like, a living example of that, that is good and perfect. And especially when you call yourself a man or woman of God. Why go through whole life weak and pathetic and emotional and doubtful and have fear? And I mean, I don't know why to be alive. Unless you just want to do drugs and have sex and eat. But I, I just, anyway, I'm tripping. I want to... Uh, and then I'll take your question. I want you to turn to, to kind of set a foundation for today. Turn to John 8, uh, 31. 8, 31. And uh, we're talking about why we need to trust truth, what it would do for us. Uh, 8, 31. Let's see here. Um. Everybody have it? Uh, John chapter 8, verse 31. Melissa, you have it? <laughs> uh, you have it? Okay. Uh, will you read that for me? Start at uh, verse 31. Jesus then said to those... A little louder. <laughs> Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him... If you remain in my word, you will truly be my disciples. Go on. Okay. And you will... All the way through 34. I'm sorry. 34. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Where's 34? Yeah. Jesus answered them, Amen, amen. I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave. No, you sin. skipped something, boy. Oh, 231. Oh. You want to read from 31 through uh, 37. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm sorry. Maybe I, I wasn't clear enough. Okay. Jesus then said to those Jews who believe in him, if you remain in my word, you will truly be my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, 
we are descendants of Abraham and we have never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say you will become free? And Jesus answered to them, Amen, amen, I say unto you, everyone who commits a sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in a household forever, but a son always remains. So if a son frees you, then you will truly be free. Uh, let me read it from mine. I have this uh, New Jerusalem Bible, and it says that to the Jews who believed in him, Jesus said, if you make my word your home, you will indeed be my disciple. You will come to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered, we are descendants of Abraham, and we have never been uh, the slaves of anyone. What do you mean you will be set free? Jesus replied, in all truth I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave. Now a slave has no permanent standing in the household, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son set you free, you will indeed be free. I know that you are descendants from Abraham, but you want, you want to kill me because my word find no place in you. Um, I read that last night because I know you guys like scripture sometimes to kind of back stuff up. But I want to talk about uh, what it, you know, being free, being subject to sin, or, and what it really, really, really means to be free. Because it sounds like a nice word, and you can go around and quote scriptures and go to church and, and claim that you're free. But when life comes, when challenges come, challenges come, you're really not free. And so I want to start this year off by really talking about what it means to be free and sin and the impact that it has on our lives to prevent us from being free. And I want to make it so simple that you will have to be dumb, crazy, and blind to miss it. All three of those things. And this whole year, because Christ came that we should be free, absolute free. And you can be free on earth. But people are not laying it out. They're not pointing the way to it. And it's, it's hard for me to, and maybe you know free people, but it's hard to find people who are truly free in this society today, especially those who call themselves men and women of God. And I think it's because they don't really know what freedom is and how to get to it, how to become free people. And so I want to get into that today and the rest of the year about being free. But you've got to have to pay attention to your life so when you go out and live and then you come back, you have testimonies about freedom. And we talked before we started taping about um, the fact that I've never thought in the last 20 years, I've not thought of, I, I've not had any concern about somebody respecting me. It just, it's not even a part of my psyche. And so when people say to me, I, don't, I lost respect for you, I can't even find the words to respond to it because I'm free from what other people think about me and I'm free from having a need of other people. And yeah, I work with people. Yes, we need to work together. Yes, we help each other. But I'm free from worried about being light. And then when they say, I lost some respect for you, I wonder how much respect did you lose? Did you lose all of it? A portion of it? Or just a part about the subject that we're dealing with here? Or just a part about the disagreement that we'll have? How, how do you determine how much respect you lose for someone? You know? But I, it was weird. It was like it was an empty word when they said, I lost respect for you. I had no response. And so when you are free, it's those things that you overcome. Because if you, got, if you have any concern at all by someone respecting you, then you're not a free person. Because that person will build you up and let you down. Oh, you just did good. You just agreed with me, so I respect you. You just call me evil, now I disrespect you. That, that's not a relationship. That's a crazy ship. And so 
we got Jesus came so that we can be absolutely free in the world, but not of the world. In the world, but not of the world. And so I want to talk about that freedom. You had your hand first and then I come to you. Um, how do you how do you kind of. Um, see where you're at in life, where you where you are, so to speak. I mean, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know how to phrase it exactly. Do you understand what I'm talking about? I think you're asking, how do you know that you have a real relationship with God as opposed to a relationship with the world still? You know, how do you know you found that freedom or that place in life where you can live that way? Are you asking that? Yeah, I mean, I think the more I go in life, um, the more I see mess ups, you know, more I see where I don't, where I've been knocked off my place with oneness with God, yeah. where I'm listening to people, yeah. where I'm following in different ways. So it's kind of hard to, and maybe I don't need to worry about this, I don't know, but it's kind of hard to see where I'm at at this point. Am I on the right track or have I fallen off the base somewhere? Yeah. And, and at I the love moment, that question. At the moment, I can't quite tell, to be honest about it. I love that question. Isn't that like a good question yes. for a preacher? <laughs> <laughs> I love that question. But maybe we want to respond first and then I'll respond to it. Uh, well, I know in my life I can see I'm on course when I'm recognizing the things in my head and the thoughts, the words in my head that are trying to pull me off course. So the more I aware, see that, then the, the influences that used to irritate me no longer have that, can no longer do that. They'll try and that'll start, but I, I just, I can let that go, whereas before it would pull me down every, you know, so often. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that, yeah. Okay. Anybody else want to respond to that? How do, how do you know when you really, really know God and you are free? You know, how do you, how do you determine where you are in life? And everybody looking at me like, what kind of question is this? <laughs> yes, Doug? I would say you know where you are based on how you deal with situations. Based on how you deal with situations. Go ahead, I'm sorry. In other words, I, I don't know if I'm seeing, I know I'm seeing more now than I used to see. So that's kind of thrown into the mix a little bit. In other words, since I see more, I see more errors and things on my part. Whereas I was more blind to errors before and I had a false illusion that maybe I was further along the whatever spiritual path. <laughs> yeah, So that, I like that. Since I see more, I don't know if I'm actually getting better at the moment or getting worse because I see a lot more errors and things now. You're absolutely getting better. And, and she's right. The way you know where you are is your reaction to the world around you. You know, if you find yourself reacting to the world, the fact that you can see that, that's where you are. And there's no such thing as further along as you thought you were. That's a deception from the devil. Because you can't determine, because our battle is a spiritual battle, you can't determine how further along you are in spiritual things. You have to take it one step, one moment at a time. One issue, one step. You can't live in the past or the future. You just deal with whatever happening now and then your reaction to the, the, the world around you, your family, your friends, uh, situations in life, will allow you to see. Is God allowing you to see where you are? For example, um, let's say that you overreact to a situation. You see, wow, I'm overreacting to this. There's something wrong with that because a man or a woman of God would not overreact to that. Right. But all you need to do is just see that and do nothing else about it. Don't judge it. Don't get angry at yourself. Don't get angry at the person. And God will start to change it for you because of ourself we can do nothing. The kingdom of heaven is inside of us. The light is inside. is allow us to see into the darkness so that we can overcome it. We don't really need to, in a way, know where we're, quote unquote, at at a certain point, <coughs> so to speak. In yeah, that's insane. Truth and, you know, and, and, and on track or off track. Yeah. And you know your relationship with God because once you're truly born again, you find yourself not subject to the world anymore. You're not getting angry about stuff. You're not moved inwardly about it. You're able to speak up and be honest with people and not judge them. And if they like you, fine. If they don't, fine. Because your heart desire is 
for them to overcome. And so you just start, you just find yourself dealing with life in the right way. All of a sudden, like when I said, when those people said they lost respect for me, it, I'm like, I had no response because it was a dumb statement. What does that mean, you know? And I've never went around to ask you to respect me anyhow. And so it was just nothing. And I was surprised to see that about myself because I never think about if people respect me or not. My thing is, am I of God? Am I loving people the way that God loved me? It's not about what people think about me at all. And so the situation would allow you to see your relationship with God. That's why the situation is there. Sometimes I wonder, what does it take to be free? Because I'm in these situations, I'm seeing this in, in term, in hate, hating other people. I'm seeing uh, uh, letting other people down. I'm seeing being off where I should be. And it's hard to live like that. It, I mean, that, it, it, that's a lot of internal pressure and internal... It's hell. It's, yeah. yeah. And sometimes I wonder, what, is, I mean, what does it take to actually, you know, to, to be free of all that stuff? Because I, I seem to want to be free of it, but for whatever reason, I'm not free of it. I don't know why. Exactly. I just wrote down the answer. That is the most easy question in the world to answer. That is the, I mean, if I tell you now, we'll have to end the service and go home. What was the question again? He wondered, what, what does it take to be free? You know, how do I become free and just stay that way? How do I know when I'm free? What does it take? And it's a very good question, and it's the most easy question to answer. But uh, I saw Hermes first, and then I'll tell you. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I can necessarily directly answer that, but the thing about the seeing, what yeah. I know is for me, is as I'm maturing, the stuff that I see now um, doesn't freak me out as much as it used to. So I think if you kind of, you're seeing things in the right with the right attitude, yes. it doesn't really matter what you're seeing. And there's no anxiousness about, oh, you know, I need this to, or a shock of seeing, at least for me. When I see it now, I'm able to accept it and just deal with it, and there's no anxiety behind it or sense of, you know, what am I going to get over this? It's just, it is what it is, and you just look at it. And I think there's an attitude that goes along with that. Yeah. You know, that's changed for me. There is, it is, attitude is required, that's for sure. Because you can't, if you want to succeed in life, or with life, you cannot be taking things personal, personal in life. And really, in all honesty, life is like a joke. The stuff we take so serious is really funny. When you come out of it, you're, gonna, you're not gonna believe that you acted so silly about nothing. You get mad about nothing. You get mad because of whatever. It's really dumb. It's really dumb. Um, you wanted to respond to what he asked? What did you want to say? I want to say if it's so easy to answer, why is it so hard for, like, for me to accept it? If it's such an easy thing to answer, why is it so hard to accept it? Because you are a prideful, ego-driven, sinful man. And that's why God said that when we sin, we are slave of sin. And so you cannot have this mindset and be of sin too. Because sin is of the devil. And when you are of sin, your mindset is of the devil. And the devil is insecure. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He has fear. He has doubt. And so anyone who sins has the mindset of the devil. They look for love or all around you, all the wrong places. So that's why. So then why do I feel like, let's just say something happens, I start resenting somebody or whatever it is, and I start feeling, after that I'm like, dang, I did it again. Why do I feel that way? Another so, good question. Uh, because you, in your sinful nature, you're playing God. So you judge, your, you judge others, and then you judge yourself for judging others. You're still making decisions. You're not, you're not allowing life to happen. You're making decisions about life. Like, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be strong. I'm not gonna judge anyone, I'm gonna do the right. And then the moment you judge, you become angry. Darn, I can't believe I, I'm just doing that. I just did that. You gotta learn, you, gotta, you haven't realized yet that of yourself, you cannot do anything. You have not realized that you are not God. And that's what the greater sin is, that folks have not 
realize that they are not God. Now they are saying, oh, I'm not God. But yet they act like God. They get mad at other people. They, they lie and cheat and steal and make decisions and, and judge right and wrong. But they say, oh, I'm not God. But why are you acting like God? Why are you playing God? Why can't you be honest with people? There are people who cannot be honest not only with their fellow man, they can't be honest with their own family. Their husband, their wife, their children, they will not tell the truth. And that's a God-like role. So that's why. You have a bit, you're a God. <laughs> you don't really trust God. You play a game with yourself. You don't know that if you once you're born again, you become his son, that he'll take care of you. He he already has a path cut out for you. And all he wants you to do is just walk that straight and narrow path. And it just works. So then why doesn't he illuminate the path a little bit brighter so I can see it? <laughs> he has, but in seeing it, you reject it because you think that uh, you shouldn't have any pain when you see it. Uh, all of a sudden, people should go nice on you. And that, uh, you know, you don't realize that because of your ego that you're just stubborn even in the light. You won't let it go. You won't take the pain of being a prideful person. You, you don't want to go through anything. You want everything to be laid out for you. But Christ had to go through things, and we got to go through it too, for true. That's how you know you love God, when you deal with people. When you deal with imperfect people in a perfect manner, then you know you love God, and you're refusing to do that. You don't even like imperfect people. Is that true or not? It's true. And so as long as you're judging people like that, you're still God, and he, he can't do anything about you because you're an imperfect person yourself. You have the imperfect person judging the imperfect world, and you're playing God, and he's just going to sit back, and he and Christ are going to go over to Caf uh, um, Starbucks. Uh -uh. Starbucks and born. Coffee bean. Coffee bean. <laughs> and get a cafe mocha in the morning and go back and turn that big screen TV on. Oh, by the way, God bought a flat screen the other day. A big one. <laughs> and he has HD and all that kind of stuff, right? So he sees us really well now. And they just sit and drink coffee and say, wow, look at Doug getting mad. Then we tell him, stop judging. And then they say, oh, Doug is trying not to judge. Oh, now he's judging himself. And, and he's like, yeah, Dad, look at him. <laughs> there's nothing he's going to do about you it's already been laid out the pathway is already there all you got to do is stop and let it happen and you're refusing to do that you still have your plan or idea in the way that it should happen and your way, your thoughts, your ideas are not his ways, his thoughts or his ideas at all they're of your father the devil because if you're not of God whether you like it or not admit it or not Say it or not, you're of your father the devil. Because we are not in control of our lives. It's whoever we serve that dictates our life for us, and yet we take credit for that too. That make sense? Yeah. Any aspect of that that you disagree with? No. And why don't, why don't you disagree with any aspect of it? I mean, it, it makes sense. It makes Right, everything you said, I can see myself doing. Yeah. So. You got to completely surrender to reality. You got to let go. Until you can do that, you will forever be your own God. You're going to suffer unnecessarily here on earth. And when you get to wherever you're going, more suffering. And there's nothing you can do about it then. You have one chance, and it seems to be the chances now. You got to stop hating yourself and others. You got to stop hating your parents. You must forgive so that God can forgive you. And unless you truly forgive in your heart, not just with words, because it's easy to say, oh, I forgive, I forgive. And as soon as something else comes along, you're angry again. You're not forgiven. And then people say, well, I forgive, but I won't forget. You're a liar and, and you're of your father the devil. Mm -hmm. Because just as God forgive and forget about our sins, we have no right to hold on to other people's sins as well. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Yes, yes, that is absolutely amazing. And by the way, you can call in by calling 800-411-BOND, 800-411-2663.
uh, email church at barninfo.org and I will answer your questions now. Let me, don't let me leave today without answering your question as to why can't I just be there? All right? Don't let me end today, this, this recording thing before that. All right? Because it's so simple, I want to answer it. Okay. Now, or maybe I should let you guys suffer through it. <laughs> Haven't we suffered enough? <laughs> you know, you just prompt me to think about something else. A person who is truly on the path of seeking first the kingdom of God in his right way, you would never ever say to yourself, why me? Why me? Why not you? Why do I have to suffer? Why are things so hard for me? Why not? Just imagine what would have happened had Christ said, why me? <laughs> These folks are not paying attention anyhow. They hate me. They want to put me on a cross. Why me? We would not have a chance to overcome had he said that. And anyone who says, why me, don't have a chance to overcome. You need to humble yourself and go through what you got to go through. It's going to make a better person out of you. All right. Let me take this young man first. Go ahead. Okay. To answer the original question, what does it... Uh what does it really take for him to, uh, to somebody to get to the, uh, get to the right pa uh, path? All I can say, all I can personally say, I could be wrong about this, but all I can say is that you have to realize, uh, realize the moment that you're not in, a, in the right path and, be, uh, and do not te uh, be tempted to judge yourself for it. When you say, and you may be wrong, but when you say, I can personally say, but I could be wrong about this, what do you mean by that? You don't know if that's true or not. Because I, I always make a mess, I make so many mistakes. I uh, I have a, uh, I have a difficult time trusting uh, trusting if I do have the truth in my hands. Right. Well, if you have a difficult time trusting the truth, then you don't have it. Mm -hmm. Because when you when you have the truth, there's no difficulty in trusting truth. It just is. It's a light unto your feet. It just is, so. Probably, but probably because I wouldn't know the truth if it bit, uh, bit me in the backside. Oh, whatever. <laughs> probably right. Yeah. I think you're too intellectual. Intellectual people are dumb people. Okay. I mean, look at how the world, look what's happening to our world right now by the intellectual. Yes. They are just messing up everything that was good because they're so intellectual that they have no common sense at all. And, uh, and God said those kind of people, they're just not going to get it. They're not going to enter in because they think that they are God. They trust their intellect more than they do common sense, more than they do what is right. And so and that's why he said we got to go dumb in order to know him. And I, and I wouldn't put so much faith in my intellect if I were you. Uh, we are all, te uh, all our intellects are tempted. Uh, tempted. Well, don't talk about we all, we're just talking about you. Well, uh, I, um, like so many, I was tempted, uh, tempted to make something on myself. That's what made me. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Another worst mistake you can make is to try to make something of yourself. The more you try to make something of yourself, the worse you become. And I know we've been taught. Oh, go out and make something of yourself. Why don't you be something? You're brought up, taught. I'm preparing you to be something, to make something of yourself. And you become an intellectual. You learn how to uh, add two plus two, but you have no character at all. And so you end up being nothing. You're still insecure. You still have doubt. You still, there was a report. Remember I said that, I don't know what this happened to do with anything, but it just dawned on me. Remember I've been saying for all last year, I said that black men from the age of 55 down are retarded. Anybody ever heard me say that? Yes. Yes. I would yell that for that. I would call nigga Uncle Tom. They call me everything but a child of God. For saying, and I said it because I just want people to wake up and realize why it's like that. So, because if you can wake up, we can change it. 
But if you deny that it exists, it never get better. It's like with your own personal life. You can't get better until you admit you're wrong without excuses. There is a report out, and we're going to be talking about it next week on the radio, right, Hermes? Yes. My producer told me yesterday that there is a report out that uh, black men, oh, what's the word? Study by the University of Michigan, uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia. See that? I told you they were crazy. <laughs> More black men. <laughs> More black men than anybody else. But when I said it, I'm a sellout. I'm an Uncle Tom. I'm dealing with men all the time, and especially black men, they are retarded. Mentally ill. Do you know the average black man can't pay rent? That's retardation. No, they can't. They really don't know how to. I know black men, 40 years old, that cannot fill out an uh, electric bill. You know how you pay your lights? You have to write a check and mail it in. I know black men, I know a black man right now. I know many, but one just popped in my head. 30 years old, can't fill out a check. You should see how they write a check. Am I right about this, Patrick, or not? I saw it. Thank you. I'm not making this stuff up. That's retardation. But this retardation comes from anger. When you are an angry person, it retards your mind, your soul, your spirit because it's of your father, the devil. And that's what I mean by retardation. They're angry, and they're first angry at mama. That's where their anger starts, with mama and grandma. And it retards their mentality because nobody corrects it while they're growing up. They glorify mama, and so the, the kids grow up getting worse. But if dad rebuked mama and keep his kids away from her, then the children can overcome that retardation, that mindset. But when you're angry, whether you're a male or a woman, you are retarded. You, think, you can't think clearly. You can't see clearly, clearly because you're in the darkness. Uh-huh. So we're going to talk about that on the radio, and I want everybody to apologize for calling me uh, Uncle Tom for saying that. <laughs> I had a woman tell me, let me show you another example, then I'll take your hand over there for us and we'll move fast. I had a woman tell me the other day that, now this is going to apply to a lot of men, and so don't think I'm talking about you in this room. Because I know <laughs> I know that whenever I bring up an issue, at the end of the meeting, they follow me out the door. What are you talking about me? <laughs> so I'm not talking about anyone in this room. Can we do that? Can we agree? I had a woman tell me that she was uh, working very hard last summer to go to school. So she like putting all her time into trying to get this thing done, right? But her man was feeling left out and gave her a hard time and made her fail in some of her grades because the man was retarded. Oh, you don't give me no attention. You know, I'm like, why would a woman want a man that act like a baby? Can somebody tell me that? Anybody? I want a woman to tell me. <laughs> somebody. What? Hey, why would a woman? No, I'm not talking about yours. <laughs> Honestly, I'm not talking about yours. <laughs> so, let, me, let me tell you guys this. Let me tell you guys. Now, if y'all blurred out y'all stuff, then that's on you guys. All right, I made it clear, because I know there are similar situations all around. You guys need to realize, I talk to truckloads of folks, and, and, and what's amazing about life, people are doing the same thing. They're just not talking about it. They're literally doing the same thing, but not talking about it, all right? And that happens every Sunday. It happens every Sunday. And I want to say about that, I counsel with a lot of people, because you guys are insecure with your stuff, and you think you're the only one in the world doing it, you're not going to stop the truth from going out there. So if you're going to do that, it, it, you know, you counsel with me, and I use examples out there, it's best not to counsel with me if you're too weak to just sit there and be quiet, because nobody will know you. They only know you when you blurt it out. Guilty, huh? Ain't that something? It's guilty. But you're right, the back of the mind thing is where it is, and that's where the hell is. <laughs> that's where the setup thing is. You got to stay out of the back of the mind. You got to live in the forefront. But I get it all the time. There's somebody else in this room, every Sunday they were like, why were you talking about me in the meeting? And this is a man, this happened not to be a woman. 
what, uh, I said something to me that you made me feel like it wasn't right. I'm like, we're just talking about truth and the people still not seeing how the devil work in their mind. He's telling them, oh, he's talking about you. Or well, you made a statement and he didn't bag it up. So it made you look wrong. And now other people are going to think you're wrong. That's what they tell me too after the meeting. Anybody ever heard me say that someone told me that after the meeting? So the devil is busy even while setting up here in the meeting. He's working on your mind. He's working on the mind. I say, get behind me, Satan. Because in here, he's not going to stop the truth from going forward. And I don't care about being light. It's up to you to do what you want to do with this. I want you to be free. I want you to be free of that mindset, which is of the devil. And you should be happy when you can see that the devil making you think certain things so you can let it go. That's the whole thing about it. But I get it all the time. It comes with my job. All right, now I lost my thought. Oh, but anyway, you made me lose my thought. Let me go to force, then I'll come back. Because time is going by so fast that I want to answer your question. Why is it so difficult for some people to come to the stillness and sustain that over the course of time? What is the, what is the chief problem that stands in their way of st st staying still and realizing um, things about life and your situation and, and recognizing anger as before it overcomes you. I love that. Jesus said that we should be still and know the truth. He said that we should go into our prayer closet and just shut up and be quiet, let the truth catch up with us. The problem is we have been taught from day one to beg God, we've been taught to judge, we've been taught to uh, make decisions, we've been taught to live by ego instead of living by the kingdom of heaven within. And so the ego, which is the nature of the God, by the, of, of the devil, by the way, which is in us until we're born again, it cannot handle doing nothing. It cannot handle sitting still and being revealed or feeling like, you know, you know how sometimes you feel like you're just nothing when you're by yourself in a room or you're at home by yourself, the radio is off and reality sets in, you feel like you're not important. You feel like you're nothing. That's all ego. It can't handle any reality about itself at all. And so a person who just lived off this ego and identified with it as themselves, if they sit quietly and allow God to work through them, uh, most people can't handle that because it's too painful. The ego is dying, but it feels as though they are dying because they are identified with this other spirit that has made a home inside of them. And so they, they, it's hard for them to just relax and go through the pain of doing nothing. Those kind of people are used to rolling their sleeves up and getting in there and doing something about everything, thinking that they're, the only solution is them rolling their sleeves up and getting right in the middle of it and, uh, and doing everything. Are you like that? No. You're not like that? No. Oh, those people are, but not you. Pardon me? You said those people are like that, but not you? Right. Oh, okay. Well, but what I, I, I've had a, a trouble sustaining being quiet and, and, and continuing to, medi to meditate, I, I, you know, I forget, I, I'm not, I guess I'm not serious enough, I make discoveries about myself and I'm inconsistent. Well, it's all ego. It's you got to let that die. I am like that. Yeah, you're all like that. See, the problem is, real, the real problem, the more knowledge you have of good and evil, the harder it is to be still and let God because you, you're living off uh, from darkness and he's constantly feeding you all this stuff you have learned and you think it's from yourself. And it seems as though the more you know, the worse off you are. Uh, but it's all ego. You gotta learn to just sit there and watch that stuff and not be a part of it, of your imagination. You have to really want, I would talk to another, nobody in this room. <laughs> 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 I was talking to, I was talking to another, you know, somebody go scream right now in this room watching. 
I, I come back to that. But I do want to say to you, I talked to your oldest son, and this is your personal business, but I'm not going to get into your business. But I was talking to your son last night, and he would tell me about the, his father, you, call him and confess something to him that you had done wrong. And he, it just made him cry. It was, he said that it was the greatest spiritual experience he has ever had with you. And I appreciate you doing that. If all fathers were to do that, they could save their families. It really impacted his life for you to do that. He said that he could not stop crying while talking to you. And that you guys had a very good conversation. So thank you for doing that. And that's what it takes for fathers to go back to their children and apologize for being weak with them, not being righteous fathers. Because when these boys and girls can love their fathers, their life is going to change just like that. And especially when it's, it's, a, it's an apology from the heart. Because you could give an apology, but it's not real. You ever had somebody apologize? They'll just apologize because you put pressure on them or they just didn't have anything else to do. It, it, it has no effect. But a, a sincere apology like that is spiritual and it will change hearts, especially the hearts and minds of your children. So I absolutely appreciate you doing that. I'm getting good at it. I have somebody every day scheduled. <laughs> <laughs> well, you definitely, with your son, you definitely impacted him. And uh, thank you for that. I wish I could get all men to do that. Apologize. Apologize to their wives for being weak and needy and emotional. Because the worst thing, the worst thing that can happen to a woman, it's not beating her up, which is bad, it should not happen. But the worst thing that can happen to a woman is a weak man. Yes. It's an emotional, needy man that treats his woman like she is his mama. He just need mama. That's the worst thing that happened to a wife and children. The worst thing that could happen is a needy, boot-licking man licking some woman boots just to get love. And women don't have love again. But I want women to be of truth, and that is love. When you can tell your man the truth and don't hate him for being weak, that's love. That is love. Amen, amen. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, the father. Uh, you're talking about the father. And I have kids at my school. <coughs> I have one particular child at my school is three years old. And the father came back in his life. He's a different child. Yes. He fall out, he don't cry. He's just a different child. Yep. And I thought. I have a grandson like that. His, mm -hmm. He's with his father. Yeah. And I, I saw the maturity in him when he came to visit. Just, you can see a change already. Mm -hmm. You absolutely see it. Yeah, I, I, and I was telling the grandfather, because the grandfather and the grandmother had the child, but the father came back in the child's life. And I told the grandfather, I said, it's a different. And he said, well, you know, he's changing before. I said, I'm not trying to say you did try to do a good job, but that's a father. And I said, it's important as a father, you don't bother. I yeah. explain to him what what's so important a father coming back in the child's life. Yeah. But he didn't quite and they need, that. They need their fathers yeah, back, not do. just for money. A father is not a paycheck. They need a spiritual man, a father, mm -hmm. who loved what's right more than anything else, more than he loved himself, his woman, or his children. And when they can see that in the father, they're going to pick that up and do it. They're going to become yeah. whatever the fathers are. So that's why, and I want to make that clear, a father is not just a paycheck. Because now this is fashionable. And I see a lot of fathers driving their kids to school and acting like little, yeah. uh, uh, what do you call that? Soccer moms. <laughs> soccer moms. <laughs> what do you mean soccer moms? You know how a soccer mom, she doesn't go to work. Okay. And she drives her kids to school okay, and pick yes, them up yeah. and take them ballet dancing and, and doing that. Oh, that's what the father did. Well, now men have been convinced that that's what they should be doing, being like soccer moms. And, and then when you see a man with his child, everybody applaud. Oh, that's so wonderful. I'm thinking, that's so dumb. They're like, oh, that's so wonderful. That's not the way it's supposed to happen, folks. 
father is not like a robot that you train to act a certain way. He has to be a spiritual example because he represents God on earth. He is his representation. And so he, and the kids are like, you could, a man can drive his daughter, or his son or daughter to school every day and be weak and pathetic. That kid's still going to be messed up. So I don't want society to convince men to act like women or take on a woman role and everybody applaud and think, oh, that's so beautiful. The devil would be totally happy with that too. The devil's like, right on. That's beautiful. You got a weak, pathetic man driving his kid to school. Now there's nothing wrong with fathers taking their children to school, but don't let the world convince you to do it because you're supposed to be doing it like women do it. If I'm married, my wife's gonna do it. That's her role. She's not going to work because she's there to make sure the household will run well. So it's her job to take him to school. Now if I'm off work, I might get off a little early and go pick him up, fine. But my role is to be a spiritual example for my family and to provide for them. Anybody disagree with that? I want to hear a disagreement. No. No. I don't mind disagreement. <coughs> because you got, don't let the world teach you how to live. And that's what we're caught up with in the country today. The world is teaching us how to live. Isn't that amazing? And look how messed up the world is, though. You have, the world have little children as young as five years old in Northern California, for sure, being taught homosexuality as normal. That's the world's teaching. So you cannot allow yourself to be taught by the world and be a child of God. The world says that it's okay to have babies out of wedlock now. That's okay. You know, who am I to judge? That's not God's way. It's not going to work. It's not good. We, we got to be of it, in it, but not of it. We got to teach the world and not allow, allow the world to influence us. Anyway, trust truth more than anything else. I saw a hand. Yes, sir. Uh, when you said before, the worst thing that a man can be is weak. Yes. Uh, when you are a weak man, and I, speaking from experience, uh, what you you know what you do? Uh, you bring the worst out of the woman. You know what? You actually literally make her a monster. And you know what? Because you are so damn weak, she can the woman even can't help herself being what she is. And even though we're in churches, you're going to say damn? Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. No wonder your wife is a monster. <laughs> you turn your wife into a monster? I did. Yeah. That will happen. And let me define weakness so people know what I mean by being strong. Any man or woman, but especially a man, that doesn't love, well, the woman should love her husband, but any man that doesn't love God more than he loves anything else, it's a weak man. And I'm not talking about a macho thing. I'm not talking about all that kind of stuff. I'm talking about in your spirit, you represent that truth more than anything else. And then when you do meet a woman, you don't need her. She needs you. But she needs you to help her overcome. Because when she look at her, her husband, she admire him, respect him, and can love what's in him. And that way she too can find God and love God. Um, a strong man is one that provides for his family, one that uh, corrects his family, one that is not movable and is not up and down in emotions when he deals with family issues. You know, he's like a brick wall of truth. And then after 50 years, the wife starts to catch on just before he dies. You know, he'll wake up, he has one foot in the grave, he'll wake up and then he'll die, but he'll die with a smile on his face because he loved his wife. He loved his children. He loved the truth. That's a strong man. Women, women need men. Children, boys and girls need strong fathers. Mm -hmm. Women need strong husbands. One that don't love them. One that they can't manipulate and control. And that's what I mean by an honest person. That makes sense? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, we are running out of time. You had your hand for a while and you left the room. Uh, did you still want to say what you had to say? You forgot. Okay. Um, Ask me your question again about how can I stay there or something like that. Well, there was a few questions, but one of them I think that you were talking about was. And I said it's so easy to answer. 
Yes. Be, how is, you know, to be free, you know, I want to be there, but it does seem so difficult to, I guess, just to be free. Okay. Here's the, here's the beginning of this. In order to be free at all times, or to start growing in it and overcoming and overcoming and being made perfect with every situation, is that you gotta first see that you're wrong, that you're not there, that you are a liar, that you are emotional, you are needy, you are, you do have fear, you have doubts, you have worry, you know, your life is not straight and easy. You need to see that and don't hate yourself for seeing that, just see it. Then you need to sit still and pray. When you pray, you, need, you gotta learn to be quiet because the kingdom of heaven is inside us, the light is inside. And when you can just learn to sit quietly and let go, then God will come to the forefront and rebuke the darkness that's inside of you. And when he rebuked the darkness that's inside of you, then you're no longer a part of that illusion of your imagination. You will be able to stay conscious, one mind of God, in the moment. You're, you'll be able to live right now instead of living in the past in your imagination or in the future, which doesn't exist, and the past is dead and gone. And so the only reason you're not staying there is that you're not staying conscious, one mind with God. You're allowing yourself to drift off into another reality that doesn't exist, and that reality bring on fear and doubts and worry and all that kind of stuff. You gotta learn to be still and let go so that you can forgive. You're not gonna enter into the kingdom of heaven within until you, until you can truly and absolutely forgive because unforgiveness is of your father the devil. Forgiveness is of God and they can't dwell in the same place. They cannot live in the same house. So when you recognize that you're messed up, you stop trying to change it yourself, just recognize it. All you need to do is see it and, and God will change it. All he wants you to do is admit that you're wrong and that's it. If Adam had said, I'm sorry, I was wrong, we wouldn't be in this mess. And so if you could just admit you're wrong and when you do see your weakness, don't freak out about it. Because people who freak out about seeing that they're weak are playing God. They want to see themselves as being perfect or strong instead of being weak. And as long as you're overreacting, you can never stay in the moment so that you can overcome. God is in the, in the moment. He's in the now. He's right here, right now. He's not back there or up there. Go ahead. You were talking to somebody else uh, earlier, Doug, about pride. You say, well, he can't get this because he's prideful. Yeah. Doesn't everybody start with pride anyway if you're not born again? We all start with the pride. So what is the difference? Because he said that we all have sin and come short. And the sin is the ego, the pride. Remember he said that when you're sin, you're a slave to, to sin, right? You can't help yourself. And this slave means you cannot help yourself. So stop fooling yourself saying that you can't help yourself. And don't let anyone tell you that you can help yourself. You can't. But, but, but I'm not sure that's answering the, the question. If, a person, if we all have pride to start with, you say, well, you, you're not getting this because you're prideful. Doesn't that apply to every human being anyway? Everybody starts with pride, and right. then somehow God's, you know, mercy and what it, his, it, he has, a, you know, your pride get, can be melted away, but you start with pride. Well, some people are more stubborn than others. Right. You know, like with me, I had to overcome that, but I was just tired of being weak and pathetic and insecure and doubtful. I was fed up with me, and I was fed up with trying to change my own life, and I just finally let go. And so I took the pain of the pride and was able to overcome it. I didn't fight back with it. Right. Because I noticed that about myself. I'm a very stubborn kind of person. And that's why you're still right. in your imagination. What causes that kind of stubbornness? I don't know. You're just a stubborn... <laughs> <laughs> what? You're stubborn kind of fellow. I'm telling you. You're just... Yes. I don't know. You're just so connected to it, I guess. You know, um, one thing about... Oh, we have, how much time we have? Oh, okay. Think about intellectual, you know, ism and stuff. I was watching the movie Jesus of Nazareth the other night, and they had uh, Long story was short Judas time. talking to Jesus. Judas told Jesus that he was an, basically an intellectual. He was a scholar, and his dad, when he grew up, he never had him work, uh, you know, the fields. He never laid any bricks. He purposely made him only a scholar so he wouldn't go through the same pain that his dad went through. 
I never oh, heard that before. I haven't either. That's the first time I heard it. Yeah, so I mean, I, I kind of see a correlation between intellectualism, which I've yeah. had, and you know that pride that it builds in you, and that stubbornness that that won't allow I have, truth to come in. I have noticed that the more intellectual you are, the harder it is to take yeah. the, the pain of pride because intellectual people want to be right. They want to rule the world. They want to be it. And it's hard to let that go. Right. It's such a nature of the devil that they're so embedded with it that it's hard to let it go. It, it, you know, you're talking about becoming somebody. Yeah. That is, I understand that completely because I've always grown up, you know, becoming something, always yeah. reaching for something. The next to the worst mistake you can make is to try to become somebody. Yeah. You, know, you would never be nothing. So don't get, when someone tell you, oh, and don't tell your kids that either. You got to grow up and become somebody. You teach them to, to develop character. And you, if you watch them, they have a natural talent anyway. And you help build that natural talent that is in them. Instead of trying to direct their lives or make them become someone, and then they grow up and become angry and drug addicts and alcoholics and sex fiends and all that. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> no, go ahead. Uh, well, I was just going to say, I guess what Pat is saying is true because I was just reading the last couple of days that people who commit suicide who kill themselves, no matter where they are in the country, they're always the people with the most money, the most yep. schooling. That's right. That knowledge of good and evil is of the devil because it pumps you up. It, you see a lot of Christian people reading the Bible. They know the Bible. They can quote scriptures until the cows come home. They color the Bible. They listen to tapes. They speak another tongue, they, and they're as nutty as a fruitcake. Some of the worst parents that you could have in a home are those that know the Bible because they have the knowledge of good, and it corrupts them. Because the problem is the knowledge of good and evil, you start basing your life on that. Instead of allowing the truth to be revealed to you through the Holy Spirit, just taking one issue, one step, one day at a time, and letting go. Uh-huh. That's what I'm talking about. It's so simple. Oh, so, so to answer your question, you, if you can learn to have that mindset of God, you can't do it on your own, but you get up in the morning, you pray, and during the day, you just be aware. Don't be lost in your head, thinking about what's going to happen tomorrow or in the next minute or yesterday, but just live for now. Then you will find yourself just... You look back one day, your whole life will change. You're not subject to the world anymore. It would have changed by itself. It's like magic. It would absolutely change. But the more you put into it, the more you overreact, get angry, judge yourself, the worse because that's the pride of the devil, which has made a home inside of you. So you got to be conscious. That makes sense? Yeah. God said that we should have his mind, one mindset, straight and narrow path. And that's what you want. All right? We are absolutely out of time. Go to my website. You can have a copy of my Be Still and No Prayer CD. And just get quietly to yourself. Let everybody else whoop and holler and do whatever they want. You just get quietly, quiet in a room. When you pray, just be still and know. And just let God take over your life. You're going to have some pain, but it's okay. No pain, no gain. you got to overcome your pride. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, we do counseling. You can call us 800-411-BOND. We need your financial support to make this happen as well. Thank you, guys. And ladies. For more information or to purchase a copy of this show, visit us on the web at www.bondinfo.org or call 1-800-411-BOND. Home.